everyone for tuning in. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, I'm here in Singapore, Skyping to the Right Honourable Helen Clark, former Prime Minister of New Zealand and Chair of the Global Commission on Drug Policy in Auckland. And today we're going to be talking about drug policy, uh, corporal punishment and capital punishment in Singapore. And so just for people who might not have this background already, just to give some background about the situation in Singapore. Uh, Singapore is a country that prides itself very much on a zero tolerance, tough, war on drugs kind of approach. And so, you know, there's a lot of strict um, laws related to drugs. You know, when you come into Singapore, you will see in your immigration cards, you know, death penalty for drug traffickers and everything like that. Um, the majority of the penal population in Singapore have been incarcerated for drug offenses, or rather they are the largest class of offenses for people who have been incarcerated. And this also applies to death row. This is an approach that's very much defended by the Singapore government over a period of many, many years, because they say that it's necessary as a deterrent and it's why Singapore is a very safe place to be. And this is something that, that resonates among Singaporeans as well. But it's already been pointed out by activists and researchers that there's no evidence that the death penalty is actually a deterrent to drug offenses or drug use. And so I, th I thought, Madam Clark, we could start with talking about how do we actually go about the advocacy with evidence and with data? Because when a lot of things play on people's intuition and emotions, it can be quite hard to convince them. I've tried telling people that there's no evidence that the death penalty is a deterrent and they just don't believe me. So what has been your experience in, in this? Well, first, really nice to be talking to a Singapore audience. I first came to Singapore in 1976 when I was uh, uh, first uh, traveling as a postgraduate student. And I've returned to Singapore many, many times over the years and, and uh, you know, met all the Singapore prime ministers uh, in its history and uh, many ministers and many people in prominent uh, positions. And you know, I, I love Singapore, I love visiting, but one of the things which has always troubled me uh, has been the use of the, the death penalty uh, and the judicial corporal uh, punishment. Uh, because uh, on an ethical basis, I find uh, these punishments uh, you know, just completely uh, unacceptable. I don't know of any evidence that says that the death penalty is a deterrent for anything. Uh, whether we're talking uh, so-called drug offending, whether we're talking homicide, murder, uh, whatever. Uh, the reality is that for a range of reasons, people do use drugs and will use drugs. And sadly, for a range of reasons, people will kill other people. Uh, but they don't have in their mind when doing these things I, I might face a death penalty. There are, there are other things going on in their lives which, which lead to, to this. So I think given that there's no evidence that it's a deterrent, then you have to ask the issue that why do uh, societies continue to impose these kinds of penalties? And of course, Singapore is not alone. You know, the United States, for example, is an outlier among uh, Western countries and still having a lot of states that apply the death penalty. But across the New Zealand's, Australia's, uh, uh, European Union, uh, Canada, it, it's just you know moved completely beyond uh, beyond the pale. I think so. In, in my experience, it's been really difficult to talk about treating it as a health issue when it's still very much uh, a sort of public mindset that this is a crime problem. Like, like that drug use is a problem about crime and it's a problem about um, bad behavior. And, and people see things like, well, if we loosen up the laws, then my kids are gonna live in a world where there's gonna be more crime, where people are abusing and trafficking drugs. Maybe they're gonna, you know, people might try to sell drugs to my children, you know, if it becomes more readily, readily available. And so it's, is this mindset where drug users are criminals and so therefore when we talk about approaching it as health a matter of health um, and giving them safe spaces 
um, it's seen as facilitating criminal behavior. So how do we actually shift that sort of framing from a, a matter of criminal justice to a matter of public health? The, the people who are using drugs, you know, they're, they're our sisters, our brothers, our aunts, our uncles, our neighbors, and they're using them for a range of reasons. In fact, uh, throughout human history, human beings have always uh, looked to some kind of substance to take them out of the reality that, that they had. Uh, but it's almost a, an accident of history that some of these things are characterized uh, you know, flowing from the UN conventions as, as being you know, not the right thing to do. And, and others like alcohol and tobacco, which are actually both quite dangerous drugs, get, get accepted, have never been treated the same way. Uh, so a lot of the very good work the Global Commission on Drug Policy has been doing is, has been really deconstructing this history and saying, you know, we need to be rational here uh, uh, about what we're dealing with and looking at what the potential for harm of, of, of drugs is. And when you uh, look at the, the potential for harm and problematic use, you always come up with alcohol and tobacco as significantly more dangerous, for example, than cannabis. And what, what has the Global Commission's experience of doing that and using all this evidence to kind mm. of um, hopefully change minds, whether you're engaging at the government level or at or the public level? What has the response been? And the, the, the Global Commission uh, is composed of a, a lot of former heads of government and heads of state like me. It came as an initiative out of Latin America because Latin America has suffered hugely uh, from the, the so-called war on drugs. So we have very articulate uh, Latin former presidents on the commission who, who argue vehemently a, against prohibition of drugs and say prohibition is the problem. You know, we, we need to have uh, more rational ways of, of, of dealing with it. So we do have a dialogue at the uh, head of government and head of state uh, uh, level. Uh, we do work you know, with, with other organisations which are working to change drug policy. Uh, there was uh, a lot of advocacy with the UN. And have you, what would you say would be the best practices in, in education as well, so public education? So I think one of the, the reasons why the attitude towards drugs is so entrenched in Singapore is because it's from a very young age, right, that we're talking about it as a crime. We're talking about drugs as evil and dangerous and you know even my own experience in school i remember being shown videos where like um they basically depict that like one puff of of cannabis is all it takes to like derail your whole life you've ruined everything you know lives get destroyed and and that creates a sort of moral panic i think um that leads to these sorts of responses so how should we speak to young people and to children about drugs so I've been a Minister of Health in my time, and uh, I was the minister who uh, took the smoke-free legislation through the New Zealand Parliament back in, in 1990. We had the most comprehensive uh, uh, legislation uh, to discourage people from using tobacco. Now, we never tried to ban tobacco. What would have been the point? You know, why would you make the person who has an addiction to tobacco a criminal? Why would you make the person who sold it to them a, a criminal? It, it really doesn't help. Uh, so it was all about harm reduction and, and health promotion. How do you, uh, you know, get across the message about what the impacts could be uh, and, and how you might you know, be able to uh, wean yourself off uh, that very, very powerful drug? And, and New Zealand's been very successful with a voluntary approach with that. Similar approach, of course, to, to alcohol, which is very ingrained in, you know, in, in so many of our societies. And, and I must take, say I take a very similar approach uh, to uh, the range of, of, of other drugs. We've just had a big debate in New Zealand about, about cannabis. Uh, and it's, it's very widely used in New Zealand, but it, it's hard to have a realistic conversation about the pros and cons and the health issues uh, while it's illegal. Because while it's illegal, the only thing the authorities really can say is don't do it. And my experience with young people is if you say don't do it, everyone wants to do it. So that, that, that's not best practice public, public health. The experience in, in the US and Canada uh, with legalization is 
just because it's legal doesn't mean that a great number more people rush down to the shop to buy it. You know, basically, what you're doing is taking it out of an illegal market into a legal market, and the people who are getting it illegally uh, then get it legally. In some states, the numbers of young people using it even went down. Perhaps it wasn't seen as hip anymore because it, it, it had suddenly become legal and they saw their parents buying it. Uh, but all I can say you know, to Singaporeans is, if you were to consider legalizing cannabis, you would not expect use to go through the roof, really. I mean, you know, there's a proportion of people who try things and some are used in longer term. Uh, but you know, frankly, uh, cannabis poses far fewer issues to health and society uh, than alcohol does, than tobacco does. And uh, it's, it's completely out of proportion the way that it's dealt with in societies where it's uh, not legalized. Uh, we just have about five minutes left. And so I'm just gonna take some of the questions that have been coming in via the live stream. And I think one has to do with what do you think about recreational drugs and the use of recreational drugs? And uh, connected to that, there was fear, you know, as, as we talked about a little bit before about evidence, is there evidence that drug consumption does not lead to crimes? Well, <laughs> it depends on the terms uh, <laughs> on which drugs are, are available. Uh, so if, if drugs are illegal, but there's a demand for them, there will be a market. Uh, and people who want to use them will access them through that, that underground market. In, in Singapore, it will be through you know, some form of organized crime as, as largely it is in New Zealand. And one of the major motivations for uh, supporting legalization of cannabis in New Zealand was to actually take control of it uh, away from gangs and, uh, and put it with licensed retailers who had to to meet to quality standards. Uh, so, you know, the, the issue is how do people get drugs? It, one of the issues with decriminalization is that if you leave supply as illegal, you've still you know, kept, kept uh, illegality uh, in the market. And that, that needs more consideration. You would deal with that across a whole range of drugs. So people also kind of worry about the different sort of, I suppose they call, you know, between the hard drugs and the party drugs and the recreational drugs. But, uh, and some have said, you know, we should legalize marijuana, but heroin should still be um, made illegal. And so would, is the commission's research suggesting that actually if we kind of legalize or decriminalize all sorts of drugs, that would be a better way or are there different sort of approaches that we have to take to different drugs? Well, the commission talks about, you know, the responsible regulation of drugs. Uh, so rather than a, a blanket approach, you take a, you know, an approach which is um, responsive to the nature of a, of, a, of a particular drug. And the level of regulation would depend on, you know, what, what is the evidence saying, uh, saying about it? I mean, the, the reality is that there is a you know, a range of drugs which people will use, which uh, which need not kill them, but the circumstances in which they are forced to consume them could be uh, very very deadly. There's there's also innovation uh, in countries, including my own, uh, where you provide for drug testing at festivals, where young people go to festivals. There's always drugs. And I say to parents and grandparents, well, would you want your family member to come home alive or in a coffin? That, you know, you want to know that if your kids are going to these festivals, you know, proportionally they're going to use drugs, so it'd be better to have a testing service and, and they know what, they, what they're getting. And I think just one last question before we reach the end of our time. Um, do you find that in the research that particular communities are disproportionately affected by drug policies, particularly oh, when yes. the world over, the world over, it's uh, ethnic minorities and marginalised people. In my country, it's it's you know quite disgraceful uh, that the number of um, arrests and convictions 
for drug offences is at least three times as high for Indigenous people, Māori, uh, as it is for European New Zealanders who look like me. Uh, there is, uh, sadly, a systemic racism in many of our criminal justice systems around the world. If you go to the United States and look at the imprisonment rates for African Americans, horrific. Uh, you'll find the same among uh, those of uh, Caribbean descent in the United Kingdom, uh, undoubtedly the same among those of African descent in, in France. I mean, ethnic minorities always bear the greatest burden of these uh, these uh, drug um, laws, unfortunately. We like to have respect for the law, but if the law is bad, then it, it won't gain respect. Yeah, I think in Singapore, we don't have official data on the, the ethnic breakdown of our penal population, but from what I've heard from death row inmates, they are majority ethnic minorities on death row as well. So Malays and Indians um, on death row. And so that's also an issue that I think is being discussed a little bit more in Singapore today. But I think we've come to the, the end of the time that we have today. Right? Thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you. Yeah, and I, it's very yeah, late where I, you are. <laughs> I really hope that you know, people, people listening will think you know, there, there, there could be better ways. And you know, why not have Singapore known for, you know, for its compassion and kindness to people and not for these very heavy and punitive approaches. I mean, I did uh, a little research and reading about judicial corporal punishment when, yet again this year, it's been in the news in Singapore with someone with dual citizenship with the UK uh, having the punishment applied. And I, I was very shocked by what I read uh, about the terrible lasting effects on health of this severe caning. So, I think you know there there are real opportunities for reform in Singapore, and I hope people will, will discuss them around abolition of the death penalty, abolition of judicial corporal punishment, and and starting down a, a more compassionate route on drug policy. Yeah, I hope so too. I think I've seen a lot more younger Singaporeans talking about that this year, so I think that's that's a good sign for us to be hopeful. But, mm. but thank you so much, and thank you to everybody who's been watching on Facebook Thank Live. You. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good night. Good night.